Harvard Divinity School. The Zirat of Imam Hussein as liturgical text in early Shia Hadiths and its role in the promulgation of Shi piety. September 15th, 2023. Uh, here at the Harvard Divinity School's project on Shiism and Global Affairs. Uh, our event today is the Ziyarat of Imam Hussein as liturgical text in early Shia Hadith and its role in the promulgation of Shi'i piety. And we are very honored to have with us here uh, Dr. Vinay Khatia, who is the academic director of the Shia Research Institute uh, in Toronto. Um, Vinay holds a PhD in religious studies from McMaster University, where he wrote a dissert dissertation on the history and philosophy of uh, Twelver Shia liturgy. Um, he also obtained his master's in history and philosophy of religion uh, at Concordia University and BA in Near Eastern Civilizations and Religious Studies from the University of Toronto. Uh, and he studied and uh, written very prolifically in this area of, of Islam and uh, um, Hadith literature uh, and prayer and ziyara. And we're very much looking forward uh, to his talk today, uh, which is part of our uh, the life and legacy of Imam Hussein research track here at the Harvard Divinity School. Um, and this is a, a particular unique program that looks at all aspects of Imam Hussein's life, including his martyrdom uh, on uh, Ashura. Uh, and only recently it was the uh, commemoration of the 40th day uh, after uh, his martyrdom, which is marked as Arbain uh, in Karbala, contemporary Iraq. Uh, it is one of the largest, if not the largest, human gathering in the world, where between, I mean, the numbers vary, 15 to 30 million people uh, congregate in, in Karbala, uh, coming from across the world, uh, to uh, commemorate the 40th day after the martyrdom um, of Imam Hussein. So this research track series is sponsored by the Jaffer Family Foundation of New York, uh, and we're very uh, happy for their uh, generous support of this line of, of, of research on the life of Imam Hussein here at the Harvard Divinity School. Uh, and with that, I'm going to welcome Dr. Vinay here uh, for his talk. Greetings, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Mossini, for having me at the Harvard Divinity School. Um, so I will uh, present my paper. I have a few slides, and then um, I assume we'll open it up to, to some questions. Um, the present study aims to demonstrate that this liturgical material, which is ziyarat material, it's a kind of genre of literature, which is a devotional eulogy or elegy, usually recited at the shrine or at the gravesite of, um, of a particular figure, right? The word ziyara literally just means to visit. Ziyara means visit, right? But for, the, for this study, um, ziyara is a genre of religious texts. It's a genre of religious literature um, which is particularly um, uh, emphasized and, and present in, uh, in Twelver Shiism. So this material was produced, at least in this study, how I articulate it, was produced in order to facilitate the articulation of a select social religious identity within a broader milieu of Islamic aid civilization. In doing so, this philological thematic study attempts to reflect the pivotal role of Ziyara in the formation of Shi'i spirituality as a vehicle for the emergence of a distinct liturgical community. This liturgical community and the specific text attributed to Ja'far al-Sadiq, which is a text that we'll be looking at, is reflective of a strain of early Abbasid Shi'ism, which coalesced around the figure of al-Sadiq. This expression of Shi'ism and pro alid sentiment vested reverence in the practice of Ziyara to al-Hussein and the motifs and the motifs of cosmic suffering uh, with which the text and the worldview of those Shi'is who define themselves in terms of it are imbued. 
The sheer number of ziyarat compositions attributed to a sadiq is a key indicator that at a minimum the inspiration of such material would have some relation to him or would have arisen in the circles contemporary or nearly to him. There is, particularly, there is a particularly emotive narration with multiple chains of transmission in Al-Kafi, um, in the work of a Saduq, uh, in the Thawab al-Amal of Saduq, uh, which, in which a Sadiq, and I'll just, I, I won't go through all of it here, it's, uh, some of it is up there on the screen for you. One of his companions comes to visit him and you know, he sees the sixth Imam, Jafar al-Sadiq, who's the sixth Imam of, for the 12 Rashi'is who believe in 12 Imams. He sees a Sadiq in a state you know, of prostration and sujood supplicating to God. So he's listening to the supplication and the supplication goes as following. Forgive me, my brothers and the visitors to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Abi Abdullah, he doesn't say al Hussein. Abi Abdullah is a, you know, another word of saying, another way of saying Imam al Hussein. Uh, they are those who expend their wealth and their end. They voyage ashhasu for the purpose of seeking our pleasure while hoping for what is with you. So basically, I, I, I won't go through. I'm not going to read all of it. In this supplication, the sixth Imam is praying for those who go to visit Imam Hussein. And he starts describing the feelings of those who go to visit the Imam. He says here, Ijabatan minhum li amrina. Right? And, and, and by visiting Hussein, they're answering our call. They're answering our command. So he says, oh God, be pleased with them. Give them heaven. Give them everything that they want. Protect them. But then he goes on into this text to talk about other things which give us a historical context about the ziyad of Hussein. Because here he says, and relief from them the evil of every stubborn tyrant or weak one or strong one that wants to, or the evil of the demons from among shayateen min al insi wal jinn, right? The, the devils or the demons in human form and in jinn that wish to ambush them, or attack them, or hurt them. Um, and then he says, oh God, you know, give preference to their children and their families and their kinsmen, protect them, because they voyage towards us. And, you know, he goes on to describe and he says, oh God, you know, have mercy on the faces whose color is changed from walking under the sun as they go towards Hussein. Have mercy on the cheeks that touch the grave of Hussein. Have mercy on the eyes from which the tears flow out for Hussein. Rahmatan lana, out of mercy for us. And he goes on and on, describing the various, the physical act of visiting Hussein and the emotions that accompany that visitation. He says, Have mercy on Asarqa lati kanat lana. Have mercy on the one that the, the one that screams for us, right? The scream for Hussein. Um, and the point of this is that there are three central motifs that are underscored here. The first being that ultimately the ziyara of Hussein is ideally performed for the sake of God. Thus, the connection between the devout Shia and the Imams is also due to their desire to, give, to, to seek divine favor. And it is God that shall reward them according to this tradition, this in, in Shi'i belief. Particular Shi'i, I mean Imami 12 or Shi'ism. This reward of divine satisfaction or Ridwan is a status described in the Quran as being even greater than paradise itself. This divine satisfaction then manifests itself in the joyous reunion of the 14 infallibles or protected ones with their devout followers at the pound of Al-Hawd. Al-Hawd has important eschatological significance as delineated in hadith which describes it as a large cistern at which Muhammad will await his followers to relieve them of their thirst by granting them access to the water of life that is whiter than milk and sweeter than honey. It is debated as to whether this pond is located along the bridge that separated heaven and hell or after the entrance into, into heaven. But those granted to access to it are deemed elect and among the saved. In the case of the narration attributed to a sadiq, which I've just mentioned, the visitors to the shrine of Hussein are granted this eschatological privilege 
and to be relieved of their thirst and distress for the sake of their emotive journey and visitation of their imam, who died both thirsty and distressed. In this sense, the visitation of Al-Hussein's grave for Shi'is takes on a profound eschatological meaning, which gives them a degree of righteous redemption from a dystopic world. This most sublime of divine rewards stems from the extraordinary sacrifice which entails the leaving of family behind only to embark on a dangerous journey, wishing to arrive at the Imam's grave with a torrent of tears and a broken heart. Secondly, this act of ziyara, especially as viewed in the early Abbasid context, in which a sadiq and his followers were situated, is deemed to be an act of communal defiance towards all those who oppose the imams, hence requiring immense courage to undertake such a journey in light of the dangers involved. Furthermore, these dangers stem not only from a hostile Abbasid, Abbasid political establishment and their supporters, but also from unseen demons, as per the tradition, a shayateen min al insi wal jinn, devils or demons in human and jinn form. Thus, these unseen beings share the earth with human beings and um, set out to inflict harm, or at least a group of them, according to this narration and this belief, set out to inflict harm on the visitors of Hussein's shrine in Karbala. These motives once again, these motifs once again emphasize an often encountered theme of an oppressed minority who rely upon divine grace in order to be delivered from the clutches of demonic armies who brim with hatred of the imams and their righteous partisans. The ziyara for al Hussein comes to symbolize a profound act of defiance and protest which would necessarily provoke the ire of their political and theological opponents. Thirdly, the act of wailing and rubbing the cheeks in the dirt of the grave is not only acceptable, but also clearly extolled by the imams as being deserving of God's mercy. It should also be noted here that the hearts are not merely saddened, but ideally in a state of jaza, which is profound, explosive anguish, which is an intense form of mourning, a shaddul huzn akin to utterly unbearable anguish which manifests itself through screaming or sarkha, as the imam says, as opposed to sober forbearance in the face of tragedy. Now, usually jaza in Shi'i tradition is blameworthy, but again, it would seem that Hussein, as per tradition, in the imami tradition, is an exception to this. And as a sadiq himself, is ascribed to have said the non-believer or al-kafir who cannot find meaning and solace in the midst of, tri of trial and bala exhibits jaza, exhibits this kind of explosive mourning. But the exception for this is Hussein. Very interesting. So Hussein becomes an exception to this general um, dislike of explosive anguish and explosive mourning. Such dramatic scenes have been roundly condemned by both moderate and fundamentalist Sunni scholars as a sign of exaggeration which contribute to the sanctification of graves. And this is perhaps a proverbial fork in the road where Shiism and Sunnism go separate ways. Consequently, traditions such as that cited above represent a paradigmatic example of what scholars such as Ibn Taymiyyah condemn in his various polemical censures of ziyara and the polytheistic practices, quote unquote, which occur. And for more on that, you can refer to Taylor's work um, in the vicinity of the righteous. It's excellent work, published some years ago, but it's very good work. It should be noted that the act of wailing, screaming, and rubbing one's body against the Imam shrine in Karbala by Shi'i scholars and the laity alike continues unabated today. And the ziyara al-mutlaqa, which is a general ziyara of Hussein, which I've chosen for study today, um, is a paradigmatic example of the phenomena that I wish to describe. Now, ziyara literature itself is very well known. It's very well attested in Shi'i tradition. As you see, there's a list there, just a sample list of some texts that are non-extent texts that I have traced back to the early period. Um, they're non-extent in the sense they don't exist in manuscript form, 
but there may be transmissions from them. And there's evidence in biobibliographical sources known as Tarajim sources or Rijal sources or Faharis or indices that there was a very early tradition of ziyarat texts. Ziyarat texts meaning books that contain eulogies and visitational eulogies to be recited. One of them is a Ziyarat al-Mutlaqa, which we're going to get to in a moment, which is basically a text or a devotion to be recited when one goes to visit one of the 14 infallibles. It's a form of liturgy. But this liturgy is very early. It has an early source, it would seem. Um, and we see from Mu'ab ibn Ammar al-Dhihni and on and on, um, the Kitab al-Mazar of Hussein bin Sa'id bin, bin Hamad bin Sa'id Mihran al-Ahwazi, right, companion of al-Rida, the companions of al-Sadiq, companions of al-Kadhim, and on and on. This is just a sample here. This is not to say that this is exhaustive, but it is indicative that it is a profoundly early tradition in Imam Shiism, originating from 175 all the way up to 300, not the ziyarah itself, but the texts, evidence of the existence of these compilation and these manuals of ziyarat. In the post-occultation period, then, we would have numerous texts written, presumably, and arguably on the basis of these early texts, these would be from al Safar al-Qummi, Muhammad bin Mas'ud al-Ayashi, Muhammad bin Ya'qub al-Kulayni, the writer of al-Kafi, Muhammad bin Dawood al-Qummi, also known as Ibn Dawood al-Qummi, Ibn al-Qawlawi al-Qummi, Ibn Babawi al-Saduq, uh, al-Mufid, Muhammad bin Hassan al-Tusi, Muhammad bin Ja'far al-Mashhadi, Radiyadeen Ali ibn Musa ibn Tawus, Alama al-Hilli, Shaheed al-Awwal, and on all the way up to Nuri al-Tabarsi, um, who died in the 20th century. So we see an arc of history in Shiism of the compilation of these kinds of texts. Now coming to the specific ziyara that I've chosen for today, and this is an example of a manuscript in my possession, um, gifted to me by my late teacher, Sayyid al-Jalali, um, which is known as Mazar Qadim. This is one of the oldest surviving extant manuscripts that we have of the ziyarat literature. It was previously owned by Sayyid by, um, if we, if we make out the writing correctly, some say this is the, uh, going back to Sayyidina Antullah al-Jaza'ari. Um, but the text itself is dated somewhere, it's about an 800-year-old text. Um, the physical ziyara text. In there, a lot of these various devotions are contained. So that's just an example here. Now, the ziyara that I've chosen for today is the general ziyara of Hussein ibn Ali. It has been given the title a ziyara al-mutlaqa, meaning general ziyara. Um, and we seldom find a single ziyara repeatedly transmitted in multiple early sources from the 4th to the 5th centuries or 10th to 11th century of the Common Era. Um, furthermore, I should note that this ziyara for al Hussein is only one of two ziyarat mentioned by al Kulaini. And it is also found in the work of Al-Saduq, Malah Hadarul Faqih. It is found in Tusi's Tahdib al Ahkam. And it is found in Ibn Qulaway's Kamil al Ziyarat. So you have a single text found in so many early sources. This is very important to keep in mind. It gives us an indication of how profoundly important this text is, that it's found in so many early sources, this text. right? And then Saduq gives a comment. Ibn Babu al Qummi gives a comment at the end of the Ziyarat where he says that this is that he gives two descriptions of this particular ziyara. He says it is a sah indi, it is the most um, authentic that I have. Wa fihi balagun wa kifaya. And in this is, 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 is basically a complete expression. So clearly it tells us that this particular ziyara is very important. Now getting to the ziyara itself. There's two parts to the ziyara. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a preamble, I'll get to that in a, in a moment, and then there's the actual text itself. In the preamble to the ziyara, it essentially prepares the pilgrimage, uh, prepares the pilgrim emotionally to visit Hussein ibn Ali. Um, and the text opens with Hussein bin Thawair narrating that a group of companions, including himself, Yunus ibn Thabyan and Mufadl bin Umar and Abu Salama al-Sarraj are sitting in the presence of Jafra Sadiq, the sixth Imam, when they decided that Yunus ibn Thabyan would be the spokesperson 
among them due to his seniority and age. It's a group of people with a sadiq, with the sixth imam. And a sadiq now replies by giving Yunus ibn Dhabyan. Interestingly, Yunus asks rather a sadiq a question, which is, what do we do when we're in the court of the Abbasids? He says, majalis ha'ulai ha al-qawm. Ha'ulai al-qawm here, then in the tradition, presumably either added by one of the copyists or added by the reporter, says, ya'ni wuld al-Abbas. Then what do we do when we're in the Abbasid court as Shias, as followers of you, we're in the Abbasid court, what do we do? Because we're put into a very uncomfortable situation. It gives us a historical context here. And then the Imam gives him a supplication to read, which is not relevant to us here, and then quickly follows up with another question. Yunus turns to a Sadiq and tells him, I'm always thinking of Hussein. What should I say when I think about him? This now opens a floodgate because now Jafar al-Sadiq now relates to him a very long tradition and ziyara. He says, you begin by saying three times, may the blessings of God be confirmed upon you, O Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Tu'aidu dhalika thalatha. فَإِنَّ salam يَسِلُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ قَرِيبُ وَمِنْ بَعِيدُ He says, begin by saying three times, O oh God, confer your blessings on, Abu Ab Abdullah is a name for Hussein, for he says that the salam reaches him from far or from close. This is very important, right? So it means that, that what Jafar al-Sadiq is about to tell him can be done from far or from close. It would seem that this question was so moving or of such grave importance that the Imam perhaps feeling comfortable enough in the presence of his inner circle and without being prompted went on to now say, and when he Hussein died, the seven heavens and the seven earths and what is in them and what is between them and all those cre creations of our Lord which inhabit paradise and hellfire wept over him. What is visible and invisible wept over Abi Abdullah. Right? Ma yura wa ma la yura baka ala Abi Abdullah. As indicated above, the death of Al Hussein is seen to have set off a series of supernatural cosmic events. This could refer to several things, both literal and symbolic, which would include the skies turning red, raining blood, or other natural disasters or supernatural events. This statement fits within the broader Quranic and Shi'i iteration of cosmological suffering centered on the person of Al Hussein the third Imam and the grandson of the Prophet. One such example would be the saying of Ja'far al-Sadiq which states that the sky turned red for a year when al Hussein was killed, as with Yahya bin Zakariya. Its redness is its sign, is its weeping, is a sign of its weeping. As for the Quran, the most common motif of heavenly tears is rooted in 4429, and the heavens and earth did not weep over them, nor were they given any respites. This allusion to cosmic weeping is balanced and distinguished by the evident belief that the drowning of the army of the Pharaoh as oppressors warranted no cosmic reverberation. Hence, the heavens did not cry over the Pharaoh when he was drowned. Atusi comments in his Tibyan, of course, Tusi being the, the, the scholar, the compiler of Tahvib al Ahkam, who lived in the, um, in the fifth century. Hijra in Baghdad, right? He was a, uh, a student of, of Sharif Murtada, of that whole group of, of what is known as Buyid Shiism, right? In the, which really was between the fourth and the fifth century, called the Shi'i century in Iraq. So Tusi was, you could say, the last of them, of that, of that group of scholars in Baghdad. Tusi comments in his tafsir, on this verse by drawing a comparison with al Hussein, for whom he says the heavens wept over him as opposed to the Pharaoh who was humiliated by God and the heavens did not. فَمَا بَكَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ right? And the uh, people of the heavens and the earth did not cry over him unlike Hussein. Conversely, the murder of, of al Hussein unleashed a series of catastrophic events in both physical and metaphysical terms. We may situate the motif of cosmic mourning and consequences once again by recalling the heart-rending moment narrated by Abu Mikhnaf in which Omar bin Sa'ad is baffled by the way Hussein is fighting like a lion, despite the fact that his children, his family, and his companions have been killed, as the tradition says, قُتِلَ أَهْلَهُ وَوُلْدَهُ وَأَصْحَابُهُ 
In other words, Umar bin Sa'd is stating that we have taken everything away from him, yet he continues to fight. And eventually the Imam is battle-worn, he's weakened. As the massacre nears its end, Umar ibn Sa'd now approaches Hussein, at which point Zainab comes out, according to the prevalent narrative from Abu Mekhnaf as Tabari transmits it, as does Mufid. Zainab comes out anticipating her brother's final demise, charges out of her tent and exclaims, if only the heaven would collapse onto the earth. She yells at Umar ibn Sa'd, telling him, shall you watch while you allow Hussein to be killed? Then will you watch while my brother is killed? Shortly thereafter, Shimr prompts his men to swarm the body of the Imam until Sinan bin Anas got off his horse, slaughtered al Hussein, and decapitated him. A group of Umayyad soldiers then began to loot his body. Suliba makana al Hussein. They begin to loot the body of Hussein, according to the historical narrations, um, which included his shirt, his sword, his sandals, even his trousers, sarawil, and he was left mujarradan, and he was left exposed. These events are portrayed as both heaven and earth shattering. The heaven and the earth, it as if it was, it was waiting in anticipation for these moments which have just been described. And Zainab's cry, hoping the heavens would crash to the earth, is poetically befitting to be included here insofar as a sadiq is attempted to put putting to words the very scene described by him as Lamma Qada al Hussein, the moment that Hussein is killed, the moment that his soul leaves his body. It was at this moment that the cosmos exploded and burst into a state of grief and ultimate, when the ultimate travesty took place. To this effect, the Sadiq tells his companions that not only does the cosmos weep, but also every single person in heaven and hell is compelled to do so. Now, the literary motif of cosmic suffering and divinely inspired mourning has been attested to in the ancient epic of Gilgamesh, in which Gilgamesh and his comrade, Enkidu, slay the Humbaba, the guardian of the cedar forest, at which the narrative reads, rain in plenty fell on the mountain, in plenty fell on the mountain. The copious falling of rain is interpreted as the gods weeping for Humbaba, as the story makes clear that Gilgamesh and Enkidu committed an evil act by killing him. Further reference to cosmic and or divine weeping can be found in the Babylonian Talmud in um, Hagiga 5b, commenting on Jeremiah 13, 17, in which it is contained, in which is contained the prophecy of weeping over the captivity of Israel. The excerpt reads as follows. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock will be taken captive. In light of the Mesopotamian literary and Judaic precedents for such expressions of cosmic weeping, these sorts of sentiments attributed to a sadiq are not unique during the early Abbasid period. Further yet, such motifs are germane to the construction of what Amir Moezi describes as pre-rationalist Shi'i ontology and cosmology. That is, the killing of Al-Hussein for a sadiq, as attributed to him by sources, is not simply a historical incident for Shi'is, which occurred within the confines of linear time. Rather, it transcends time to render even the seeming bliss of heavenly residence of heavenly residence We'll get there in a bit. Of heavenly residence, that it, that it even resi even the, 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 the heavenly residence becomes a site of perpetual weeping. That is to say, the sum contents of everything, of, of the entire metaphysical realm, enters into a state of perpetual wailing. And this motif of cosmic and heavenly mourning is found in another ziyara attributed uh, through a chain of transmission to Asadik, in which he states, weighty upon us is the massacre, and colossal is the tragedy which befell you and upon all the people of the heavens and the earth. <laughs> Furthermore, the purposeful use of Quranic imagery should not be lost here. You can refer to 1744 in that regard. Thus, in the preamble to Aziyar al-Mutlaqa, 
By a sadiq using the participles wama fiha wama bainahuma, that which is in it and that which is in between it, he is emphasizing that God's kingdom and the very substance and the very substance of the unseen weep for Hussein. Hence, the second verse states that all of existence is infused not only with God consciousness, right, as the Quran says, but it is the people that cannot sense that, that, that everything is doing, is engaging in God's praise. Right, so the Quran alludes to this idea of animals and trees and rocks and everything doing the engaging in the tasbih or the praise of God, but it's people that can't understand that praise. Drawing this within the ontology that's envisioned by 12 Rashiism, it is not then unusual within, with this ontological perspective, with this understanding of, of ontology, that heaven and earth and everything in it would cry for Hussein, because the cry for Hussein is symbolic in Shiism as the very praise of God, because you're crying over the one that is slain in the way of God. And that's why the Ziyadah describes Hussein, this Ziyadah, as Qatilullah. The one that's killed for God. It doesn't mean death of God, of course. <laughs> Someone doesn't know Arabic would literally translate it, literally death of God. Qatilullah. No. Qatilullah meaning the one that's killed for God. The one that's Qatilullah, then the tasbih or the praise of God is connected directly to praising the awliya of God. It's not the worship of Hussein, per se. It, 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 that is. It, it, it has to be, I argue, understood within a cosmological and an ontological framework through which she is, would use these verses of the Quran and then deploy them in their understanding of cosmological um, and heavenly mourning and suffering. According to Atusi, even, we see this theme again coming up in a letter sent by the 12th Imam to one of his companions in Azerbaijan, in a tawqi, where he says, oh God, for the sake of Hussein's promised martyrdom, prior to his coming of age and birth, as a result, the heaven and whatever is in it, and the earth and whoever is on it wept for him, Bakatu. So we have another tradition attributed to the 12th Imam in a rescript and a letter sent to a representative in Azerbaijan Tusi narrates this in his Misbah al-Mutahajjid, again indicating this um, kind of cosmic mourning and cosmic suffering. Another way that we could look at this kind of language is that it's designed to produce an aesthetic experience that causes the reader to enter into a state of awe, as Lara Harb, in her analysis of Abdul Qahr al-Jurjani, Approach it, uh, uh, Abdul Qahir uh, Jurjani's approach to the science of Arabic eloquence posits that the elicitation of wonder is a form of eloquent elucidation or bayan, which makes something manifest that is otherwise hidden from the reader. So they're trying to, so th there's another element here, right? That while there is this cosmological kind of ontological, whatever, you know, metaphysical speculation, there's also a literary aspect here. It's also a literary aspect. And such motifs of heavenly mourning and suffering in the ziyara can certainly be described as an instance of bayan and or mubalagha, which constitutes to intensifying the imaginative religious experience by means of literary devices. A Shi'i theological perspective as gleaned from the ziyara would posit that if creation sings the praise of God, then it can equally mourn al Hussein. That's theological. And then, of course, this is literary. So my point is that it can be looked at in different ways. Then the Imam very quickly goes into a discussion, a little bit of a controversial discussion here. Things get a little bit um, controversial at this point, or for some it would be controversial, let's say, you know, for where Assad continues to say that while everything weeps for Hussein, this is all the preamble to the ziyad itself. There are only three entities that don't. And those three things did not cry over Al Hussein. Yunus asks him, Well, what are these three what are these these three things? Kultu Jal to Fidah, al Ashya. What are these three things? And he says, Lem, 
تبكي عليه البصرة ولا دمشق ولا آل عثمان عليهم لعنة الله. This is I'm I'm not I'm reading from the text verbatim, um, not adding that. That's from the text itself, of course. So Basra, Damascus, and the progeny of Uthman upon them be God's curse. Prior to discussing the mention of these three entities or people, a brief introduction to La'na is in order here, before we get to this, these three entities here. Um, La'na is a verbal noun, which could also be rendered as malediction or a spell which entails the befalling of misfortune upon the accursed or the mal'oon. The tri-little root, La'na, right, lam ain nun, has been used as both a verbal noun and a verb, and a noun 41 times in, ver in these various forms in the Quran, predominantly as an expression of divine condemnation. There are verses in which people and angels, along with God, also engage in cursing as a reinforcement of God's curse. One particular example shall suffice here from uh, Quran 2, 159 and 3357. Indeed, those who conceal that, that what we have sent down of proofs and guidance after we have made it manifest and clear for the people in the book, they are those whom God curses. They are those whom God curses and, and, and the cursors. There's a group known as la'inun in the Quran that also perform this la'in. Verily, those who molest God and his messenger are cursed by God in this world and the afterlife, and he has prepared a humiliating punishment for them. And that's another verse, uh, 3357. So for Shi'is, these verses and those like it demonstrate, and by Shi'is here, I'm, I'm, I'm qualifying this as Imamiya Ithna Sharia, 12 verse. Um, for Shi'is, these verses and those like it demonstrate the act of praying against someone or praying for the misfortune of others is in fact not a disliked act. However, the question remains as to who qualifies to be subjected to such a curse. In the case of 12 Shiism, all those who are believed to have harassed the family of the Prophet will be treated no differently from the one who has harassed God and his messenger, in the sense of taking an antagonistic position against them. As Eaton Kohlberg has aptly pointed out, any opposition to the rights of, of, of Ali and his family is a grave sin. And those guilty of this should necessarily be cursed. For the imami's cursing itself is not prohibited, and the companions, or for that matter, Anyone guilty of opposing the Prophet and his family would technically be subject to such a um, supplication. As the creed developed in the formative period from the 2nd slash 8th century of the Common Era, 2nd Hijri, 8th century Common Era onwards, Shiism remained a school of thought with multiple streams of theology, within which the subject of cursing was fiercely debated. This debate arose in no small, in no small, in no, so, in no small part due to the obvious destabilizing ramifications in demonizing those who are seen as spiritual heroes by others. It should be noted that la'na is not necessarily synonymous with foul language, sub or shatan. Of the two words, sub has been used in the following Quranic verse, do not insult those who supplicate to other than God. La to subbu, right? And the lexicographers generally of, of, of scholars of, of Arabic words, you know, and, and who, those who work in etymology don't generally draw a connection between the two. That la'an is not necessarily construed as swearing. La'an is a supplication. Now, in common parlance or in colloquial, it would be seen to be similar or Similar or same concept, perhaps, but not linguistically, because la'an literally means it's a prayer asking God to remove his mercy from someone. That's what it means. The hab al-rahman is, God's, is, is, is a prayer asking God to remove his mercy from somebody. Now, in, in colloquial parlance, of course, that would be offensive to someone, <laughs> you know, because in those days, that's essentially like putting, a, 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 you know, like a kind of malediction upon someone. Um, so thus, those who, you know, who would be the subject of that would, you know, deem it to be blasphemous. So clearly, you know, it becomes a very sensitive issue in 
you know, as Islam, um, as the schools of Islam developed and, and evolved. Um, and La'na can also be understood as, um, as offensive, of course. Again, depending on how it's used. But the fact that the Quran uses it so much, it's used all over the Quran, would indicate that as a word and a concept, it clearly is a part of the linguistic um, culture of, 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 of Islam. The only question is, who does it apply to? To whom is it, is it directed at? That's a different question altogether. So the use of it here is not surprising. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's something that's, that is used in the Quran, God's curse be on the oppressor. So then who's an oppressor, they would ask. One person's oppressor is another person's hero, isn't it, sometimes, right? That's the way the world works, right? So, um, and in Shiism and the way these, you know, the, the way the history and the past is imagined and constructed by different um, schools of thought, it would turn out that one person's hero would be the other person's oppressor. And so clearly these would then become very controversial and sensitive issues, but it's replete in the ziyarat literature. I don't think it can be erased from the ziyarat literature. Um, now, why these three people or cities? This is interesting. <laughs> Like poor, like the people of Basra, like what did they ever have to do to get <laughs> cursed forever? No, I, I think that, um, uh, I mean, the other two are, I mean, Damascus and Ala Uthman are pretty straightforward there. You know, Uthman being, you know, Ala Uthman being Umma, the Umayyads, clearly that's clear, that's kind of obvious. Damascus kind of obvious as being the heart, hotbed of Umayyad power, right? But why Basra? This I found very interesting. And there are reasons for why Basra is mentioned here. Um, one would speculate that it is included due to it being conceived of as constituting a bastion of proto-Sunnis who did not adopt the Shi'i narrative with regards to succession and the temporal cosmic authority of their imams. More specifically, it could refer to those Basrans who fought alongside uh, Aisha, the wife of the prophet, against Ali at the Battle of the Camel and remained in a state of disloyalty towards both al Hassan and Hussein. In this regard, Sheikh al Mufid narrates in his work on the Battle of the Camel, the Battle of Jaman, uh, which is one of the, the early fitnas or the early civil wars in, in Islamic history. He narrates that, O people of Basra, you are the, he narrates a, a, a sermon from Ali who says, O people of Basra, you are the wretched of God's creation. You opposed your imam, for you were the first to violate your pledge of allegiance. For innakum awwalu, awwalu nakatha al bay'a. You were the first to break your pledge of allegiance. Um, so this, this, this might be a reason why they are uh, singled out here, the people of, of Basra, in that historical context at that time, of course. In an alternative account of the above sermon found in the tafsir of Ali bin Ibrahim al-Qummi, Ali is claimed to have said, you, the people of Basra, have been cursed on the tongue of 70 prophets. In fact, Imam al Hussein had also written to the Basrans, insisting that he was a rightful successor to the prophet's legacy and invited them to the path of guidance. Yet, yet none who read it chose to support him in the end. So I think this may give us some reasons as to why the Basrans are included in this curse. Um, therefore, it's within the broader geopolitical and historical context that the curse upon the Basrans may be understood in light of what was perceived to be their continuous infidelity towards the cause of the Imams, at least from the Imamat of Ali to his son, Imam al Hussein. It should be noted here that the sweeping declarations such as these aim to pour scorn upon the foes of al Hussein or those who were viewed as being responsible for his killing, either by partaking in it or facilitating it, being pleased by it, or even indifferent regarding the matter altogether. The curse leveled at the Basrans may also be understood within the context of the famous Basran-Kufan rivalry, 
which was both religious and literary, in which numerous debates regarding the virtues of both cities took place. These debates took place in the presence of both Umayyad and Abbasid officials, in which very often Kufan partisans would claim superiority based on their support for Ali and even the Abbasid Caliph al Safah. Therefore, to find such curses upon Basra is not unusual due to the people of the city being constant, consistently cast as anti alid by Shi'is during the Umayyad and the Abbasid period. And this is not the only instance of malediction in this text. There's another lengthy passage uh, where, uh, the, where the sixth Imam says, or is attributed to have said, Cursed is a community that killed you, and a community that opposed you, and a community that opposed your authority, and a community that claimed to support you, and a community that bore witness but did not affirm their testimony. All praise is due to God who made hellfire their final abode, the worst place of arrival, and the worst destination. So a portion of the scathing supplication may be an indirect polemical reference to the event of Ghadir even where the prophet's appointed son-in-law and cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib as his, as, his, as his successor. But we don't know exactly. I mean, we can only read this and speculate. We don't know exactly what it refers to because nobody is named here. These are general references, but again, it is indicative of this feeling of betrayal. This is an important point if you want to take away from here. The curses come out of a feeling of profound betrayal, right? People stand up and say, we're with you, then they turn against you to kill you. They stand up and say they're with you, then they turn again to kill you. And it's on and on. It's this recurring cycle in Shiism, right? This, return, this recurring cycle of, of betrayal after betrayal after betrayal, whether it be with the Prophet, whether it be with Ali, whether it be with Hassan, whether it be with Hussein, and on and on and on. So that portion of the community here, right? Jahadat wilayatikum. And the community that bore witness, but didn't follow through on it. Right? This whole idea of bearing witness to the family of the Prophet, right? This is a very important concept to understand the kind of um, the way Shi'is identify with history through their Imams, of course, is, is, is the idea that so many people claim so many things yet so few people ever follow up on their pledges of allegiance to the imams. Um, and Hussein ibn Ali being a case in point, right? All those letters that came to him saying, come to Kufa, come join us, we're with you, right? Tabari includes them in his, in his history, right? Describing, al-ajal, al-ajal, ya ibn Rasulillah. Come quickly, come quickly. You know, the, 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 um, the leaves are turning green waiting for you. Awraqat al-ashjar. You know, like these are the kind of expressions you see in, Tabar, in, in the letters that Tabari includes. And then those same people or groups of them are on the other side of the battlefield participating in his murder and the pillaging of his family. So these instances within the Shi'i consciousness manifest itself in statements like this, right? They have to be understood within, it, within the broader historical context you know, um, of, of history. And then the Abbasids become no different, as in the case of the Abbasids, right? The Abbasids claim, they come into power and they say, Arrida min Ali Muhammad, we're coming, we want someone from the family of the Prophet, this and that, they're holding the shirt of Hussein, right? This is for the shirt of Hussein, right? The, the bloody shirt of Hussein, you know, we're going against the Umayyads, we're finally taking everything over, and then boom, just complete bloodbath. Again, right, it's this whole notion that people can't be trusted. But it's not all dystopian because, and I'll just, just conclude on this, on this note, it's not all dystopian because at the end of the ziyara, and I, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to go through it, maybe we can, we can have a discussion about it later, the saving grace of all of it is the 12th Imam for Shi'is. Because in the ziyara, like we see in this particular ziyara, like we see in the ziyara of Ashura and others, 
The saving grace is when it, at the end of the ziyara, where Jafar al-Sadiq says, so the person's facing Hussein, crying, reciting the salutations. They can imagine they're in front of his grave, and then they say, Bikum biha, that the spilt blood of every person's unjust spilt blood will be claimed and avenged by you, Bikum. This notion of this return, of this divine return. One, the return of the imam from occultation, and then the return of the other imams, the concept of raja. But there's this profound, mezzanaic, charismatic, and eschatological motif that comes at the end of the ziyara to kind of save grace here, saying, don't worry. All this has happened, all this betrayal has happened, all this blood has been spilt, but don't worry. Because every ounce of that blood, every drop of that blood will be avenged. Bikum yafukku adhil an riqabina. That by you, whatever humiliation has been put upon us shall be removed. And this is very critical at the end of the ziyara. Because it leaves the pilgrim with this sense of satisfaction now. That okay, I've spilled my heart out. I'm sad, really upset with everything that's happened. But it's going to have a happy ending, just not sure when. And that's why Messianism and this kind of eschatological association with Messianism uh, is a very important part of Ziyara. Otherwise, the Ziyara becomes quite dystopian. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to conclude on that. You know, in conclusion, Ziyara literature is extremely important part of Twelver Shiism. It is extremely early. It goes back, it's profoundly early and ancient, going back at least to the historical period of the Imams. Um, there are hundreds of, of, of texts of ziyarat, texts like this. I've chosen this one particularly because it is so um, well narrated and attested to, found in so many early texts, um, which I think is also an important element to demonstrate that Yes, there are different streams of Imami Shiism, even within Imami Shiism, different streams of understanding, but this particular text is so widely found that it would seem that it would cross from what Amir Moizi describes as pre-rational and rational or whatever we want to call, whatever we want to describe these different eras or of, 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 Shi, of Shi'i theology. So um, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Okay, I see we have questions on chat. For those in our Zoom uh, audience, please write your questions in chat. We'd be happy to uh, choose and ask them to our uh, guest here. Uh, allow me to maybe begin with the first question, sure. Vinay, and then we'll open up to the audience here as well for uh, any questions that um, people may have. Um, so it's very interesting and very useful to think of ziyara when we usually think of ziyara or the manuals for undertaking pilgrimage is just under the category of ritual, right? And it seems that you're saying, you know, it's much broader than that. We should think about how it informs theology, philosophy, the worldview, the cosmology. Um, maybe you can speak a, a bit, a few more words about then the implications of that, how in academia should we then approach ziyara or other forms of what are seemingly ritualistic aspects of, I guess, any religion, but here Shiism specifically. How should we approach it academically? How can we study, look at the influence, the impact in the development of theology, philosophy in these sorts of manuals? Um, and then a second question to that would be an epistemological question on what the knowledge and science can be understood as. And how would this inform, or can this inform us of uh, Marifat al-Imam, on the knowledge of the Imam? How can this be used? As in, can reading the ziyara give us Marifat of the Imam, or knowledge of the Imam? If not, why not? If so, how sure. so? <laughs> Very intelligent questions. Both would require a book written about it. Um, the first answer is, um, or the first question, the first answer to your question about um, ziyara as ritual versus ziyara as you know as a form, as a, as a, as, a, as a expression of theology, it has always been an expression of theology. I think it's just the ignorance of those who don't know about it. It has always been an expression of theology 
from the very beginning. It is found in theological texts. It's found in hadith texts. It is a genre of hadith. It's classified as a genre of hadith. So because it's classified as a genre of hadith or aqwalul a'imma or the saying of the imams, it's deemed to be a form of sacred literature. If it's deemed to be a form of sacred literature for Shi'is, then it is um, it has information, i'tibar. There is information in it to be gained. That information can be of so many different types, but it is certainly um, um, part and parcel of shaping a worldview. Anything that comes from the imam as a statement believed to be ma'thur or transmitted from him in the case of ziyara can shape the worldview. Now, this in this case, it is so important because it becomes a nexus between ritual and belief. And I describe this in my forthcoming monograph as a form of devotional theology. It's a Christian term, but I really think it is useful in this case. That, that ziyara and dua, I would say, um, that these manuals are forms of devotional theology or liturgical theology, we could say, um, or performative theology. It's where the performance meets theory. Theory meets performance. Right? That it's an acting out of a script, but that script itself is a theological script in and of itself. Um, and naturally, that would then give us a treasure trove of information regarding Ma'rifat of the Imam, <laughs> of what is the Imam thinking, what is he saying. In fact, it may even give us more than we would get regularly because it is in the ziyarat that they're uncensored generally as uncensored as possible, shall we say. I won't say completely uncensored, because it's clearly, um, you know, isharat without clarity sometimes. You know, there's this allusions to things without, you know, naming things very, very particularly. But it's because it is something that is so heavenly rewarding, um, the script, both the script and the performance, it gives us a window into how Shi'is understood their imam without a veil, so to speak, between them and the imam. So I think it gives us a unique entrance into understanding the imam's worldviews and ideas on things. So. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Can I just say stand Yeah, yeah. No, okay. so. Any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay, for the uh, excellent talk. I thought it was very rich and uh, really covered a lot, large expanse of, of topics. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the origins of Ziyada literature. Um, a lot of the early texts that you showed use the term mazar. I mean, it comes from the same root, but um, it's also used uh, in terms of both pilgrimage, right? Um, so the, the word is a multivalent meaning, but also for the ritual, like the, the, the corpus of texts. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the origins and is this a unique Shi'i contribution to Islamic civilization literature. Uh, we know that, of course, like many other Muslim Sufis, uh, in particular, might go on, like Sunni Sufis, for example, might go on uh, different types of pilgrimage, but it seems to be more localized, and, and the extent and scale seems to be very unique uh, within Shi'ism. So uh, maybe if you could talk, were there other genres that you would say Ziyara drew a lot from? Obviously, it's taken from the Quran, the Hadith, but uh, are there specific gen literary genres um, that you would say, in the origins at least, played an influence, or um, if you could just talk more about that. Well, I would say, uh, you know, in terms of literary genres, I would say it certainly draws from the genres of, of, of mubalagha and bayan and, um, and takhil, which are all these literary devices which inspire imagination, thought, because they're also uh, poetic, really. They, they rhyme, they often have prose, especially the supplication literature. I'll put supplication and ziyara together in that sense. The devotional literature in general is as much poetic as it is theological. So they are works, I would say masterful works of Arabic language, first of all. The choice of, the choice of verbs, of adverbs, of nouns, um, it's, it's, it's a site of just linguistic study. You know, I remember Professor Lawson telling me some years ago when I was working on this under him as, for my dissertation, um, incredible scholar, Dr. Lawson, just an absolutely incredible scholar. 
um, you know, and, and, and him reminding me about this and saying, hey, wait a second, Vinay, take a step back here and treat it as a form of literature as well. So it's a genre of literature, um, of Arabic literature, I would say of, of uh, some of it, we would say of, of, a, of a very high rank, certainly. It's, it's very baligh, you know. Now, in terms of other Muslims performing ziyarat, yes, yes, we have evidence of, of Nizam, of, of the Seljuk um, rulers visiting Hussein ibn Ali, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, visiting Rida Ali, you know, in, in, in Imam Rida, the eighth Imam, but not scripted like this, no. This is, this is I, I would say, is unique to Shiism. Um, why is it unique to Shiism? Well, again, because of the devotion towards the family of the Prophet. I mean, as Amir Moizi, I think, says very well, um, Shiism and Sunnism, when it comes to this, is oil and water. It, they, they just are in different worlds. It's one Mars, one Venus. It's it just, there is, no com there is no unity on this issue here. Sunnis, of course, revere the family of the Prophet, would visit them, but not like this, not with the crying and, and the putting the cheeks on and, and all of that. It, this is... Uh, not to this extent, in 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 a in, in a scripted in in a in a scripted way. I mean, Sunnis would perform these things. They would cry. They would mourn for Imam Hussein alayhi salam, but not in the sense of of having these uh, scripted liturgies. There are some, like there are there are mazarat that the Sunnis have, especially during the Mamluk period. We see uh, mazarat literature, but when you look within that mazarat literature, it's not. Um, they don't have um, scripts. It's not like the riwayat from the prophet, for example. So it's not treated as a form of sacred literature. This is my point. So whatever activities are performed there, so even not to say that a Sunni can't cry. I mean, Sunnis come to Karbala. They, like I said, the history is full. These are not only these, these individuals don't belong only to Shi'is. They're universal figures of love. But the way that love is expressed, the script through which that love is expressed, is different between Sunnism and Shiism, okay? That's what I mean by oil and water in this sense, in the sense that the degree to which she is emphasized on this concept, you know, that heaven is rewarded, a thousand hajj, a thousand umrah, you know, these kinds of things for visiting Hussein ibn Ali, these kinds of traditions or ahadith um, uh, would not be considered to be at the very least mainstream in Sunni Islam. Um, or if anything, they would be considered to be, you know, going a little too far, perhaps. But that doesn't mean that there isn't devotion to the Ahlul Bayt. There absolutely is devotion, but not in this way, not with these kinds of scripts written. And I think that's, that's a key difference. And that's also why Ziyara becomes very much an identity marker for Shiism. The Ziyara literature itself becomes very much an identity marker. For twelve Shias, for 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 Shiism and twelve Shi'is, in 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 particular, and you see this this, this preoccupation with compiling ziyarat texts. As I mentioned at the beginning, the scholars of twelve Shiism, the muhaddithun, the fuqaha, the mutakallimun, all of them participating in this practice, from majlisi to mufid. I mean, that's like several centuries, right? of people with very different persuasions, very different ideas, very different methodologies in jurisprudence and theology, perhaps, certainly, but having an equal or similar love and preoccupation with this kind of literature. We just don't see that on the same scale in, 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 in Sunnism. It's just it's nowhere near, not even comparative, I think, not on that, not on that scale in terms of, 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 of the sheer volume of the, of the Mazarat literature itself, I think. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vinay, uh, thank you so much for the talk as well. Uh, if, if I could ask, I, I was also very intrigued by the, the mention of Basra uh, and just the idea of sort of like the historical context uh, informing specific things and which things were sort of being named or enumerated. So I guess one question I have is like, I think in the popular Shi tradition, I think more of like Kufa as being put in that position of uh, talking about the people of Kufa as in the vein of like hypocrisy or, or turning their backs on the Imam. So uh, is it sort of like by the time of the sixth Imam, the reputation had shifted 
where, like you were saying, Kufa is viewed as more pro-Alid. And did Basra have sort of this continuous reputation? And then also, I guess, more broadly, um, are there sort of different, like maybe in later Zayarat or the Banu Abbas mentioned, are there differences that you see in, in that vein of like the historical context changing? Yeah, I, I would say, by the, of course, by the time of the sixth Imam, Kufa is a very Shi'i city, a very important place of Shi'ism. So I think cursing that city would not be a good idea, certainly at the time of the sixth Imam. I mean, the, the, the Imam's main companions are there, right? The narration of, of traditions are coming from, from Kufa. Um, and so I think that's, that's one, one way of, of explaining it. Um, and what was the other one about Banu Abbas, you said? Yeah. I was just wondering if you noticed like uh, other places being named or like, I guess this is like the, you were mentioning the Banu Umayya were sort of uh, referenced. So uh, later on, are there like other sort of figures or other opponents of the Ahlul Bayt that are added on as well? Uh, in other ziyarat, yes, there are. Yeah, certainly. There's so many, so many different uh, names that are put, right? Ala Marwan and all of these other things are mentioned, for example, in the ziyarat of Ashura. But this is unique in terms of having particular cities and, and people mentioned in this way. I, I would have to go and look through all the literature again. But from what, from what I remember in terms of ziyarat itself, the ziyarat genre and literature itself, um, this is one of the only places where I've seen Basra being mentioned in this way. Ala Uthman is understandable, of course. That, that's, that's, that's quite common. Yeah. Something yeah. Uh, really quickly is, uh, uh, I was reading um, a source from As'ami, so Abbasid era, like 9th century, um, and I think it might have been relevant somewhat to, to the narration that you brought in. He brought in a narration saying that Kufa kulluha alawiya, Basra kulluha Uthmaniya, uh, and uh, Sham kulluha uh, um, uh, Umawiya. And then, uh, so saying that Kufa is fully Alid or like Shi'i, uh, Basra at that time, so he's writing, you know, um, early uh, 800s, probably probably something around that time, the Abbasid, early Abbasid era. Uh, Basra being here, interestingly identifying it as Uthmanid, uh, whereas in the narration you brought, it separate, you know, it brought Uthman uh, in, in Damascus or Sham. But here in, the, in As'ami, um, and it's, it's cited in uh, Iqdil Farid, um, saying that, uh, instead, re re rearranging where the loyalties lie. So Uthmanid, Basra, uh, Umayyad, Damascus, uh, Shia, Iraq, uh, and then Sunni, uh, Hejaz, basically. So I don't know if that, that uh, I think it's just interesting um, uh, just to think about those, how, how those terms can also move around. So contextual ideas of which cities affiliated with which faction and uh, political, theological loyalty. Um, thank you, first of all. Um, I have a two-part question, kind of. Um, based on the saying by Imam Sadiq, where he says that only three things don't cry over Imam Hussein, and the fact that there are both Muslims and non-Muslims today that don't cry over him, is the implication that these people are the progeny of Islam, or at least akin to them? And therefore, does simply the act of not crying over him, even if they're sympathetic towards him and his suffering, make them undeserving of God's mercy? I think it's, um, this is again a kind of literary motif here. I think we have to understand this as a literary motif not to be taken literally. So for example, in other ziyarat, you know, all of the descendants of the Umayyads are cursed, right? Atiba, right, you know? Um, these generally refer to places where, as Muhammad just mentioned, were hotbeds of anti alid uh, you know, um, tendencies and, and, uh, and movements. And, and, and it's always, as far as I understand, been understood in that context, not in the sense of every single person that is in Damascus and will ever be there, or every single person that is in Basra. The Arabic language uses this kind of, um, as I said, mubalagha, this hyperbole. Hyperbole not to mean that the imam is using it in some kind of, um, extreme way, but hyperbole is a part of language, right? To express emotions, to express sadness. Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily meant, at least as far as the, the scholars have understood this, and I've read at least 10 commentaries or maybe seven commentaries on this particular 
Seattle across the board, and, and nobody says that every single person from there is cursed, or every single person who doesn't cry for a saint. What I do discuss in the book, though, because I didn't have time to present everything here, in the book is this refers more to the sense of being denied the privilege and the opportunity to cry for Hussein because of the stance that they took. So they will forever be in that state of not being blessed by God with the mercy of crying for Hussein. It's again a part of the denial that the crying for Hussein is a sign of mercy, as the Imam said, Rahmatan Lana. So they're denied of that mercy because of the, the position they took to stand with injustice against justice. It's the implications of it, right? So thus even the Imam says that even the people of hell cry for Hussein. Except these, these three people. Meaning they're forced, they're compelled to cry. Not that they're crying out of their own will. That, that God forces them to cry for, for, for Hussein. But there are some people that are so bad, that are so beyond the pale, that it would seem that they even fall out of that uh, you know, category, although they would probably end up in hell at some point, but while they're in this world, their hearts would be, would be, would be denied that. It could be interpreted in so many different ways. We don't know. Again, these are, these are very cryptic passages that are just, which I guess give lots to write about and speculate about. Yes, Nicholas. Thanks so much for a really fascinating talk. You, you hit on a point which I think is uh, really important of reading the Arabic um, and especially the background to this because it just seems really strange if the Prophet is rahmatan lil alameen, if the Prophet is declared by the Quran to be a mercy for all the worlds, why then um, is would the Imam ask for people to be cursed? Um, but one of the ways of reading the Arabic is the way you just translated it too. It's simply a statement of fact. Like not that, that the Imam wants, uh, there's two ways of reading it and it could be interpreted either way, but a call for some people to be punished is one way of reading it. The other one is just saying, this is what it looks like to be excluded from God's mercy. You no longer have the, the blessing of, of being able to understand what it means to weep for Hussein or something like that. So I think have, both of them are on the table and I really, I just wanted to draw attention to what you just said, that that's another way of, of reading it, which seems also cogent, um, which might make it easier to kind of address some of these issues as well. Thank you, yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks. Questions? Thank you so much, oh, Renee, thank you. Uh, yeah. for an excellent talk and an excellent conversation. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sponsor, the Project on Shiism and Global Affairs at Harvard Divinity School. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.